So hi, this is a presentation on the Assemble Plus Transnational Access Project Diatom Interactions in Sea Turtle Episode Biofilm. My name is Clara Filek and I come from Zagreb, the capital of Croatia, near the Adriatic Sea and right across Italy. I'm a PhD student at the University of Zagreb and the Assemble Plus program enabled me to visit Ghent to do some of my PhD research here. This is an invaluable experience for me, especially in, in this field. S but what is it that I do? I've mentioned some diatoms and turtles, but what is it exactly that I do and why? So for the last two years, I've been a part of the Turtle Biome Project that wants to discover what kind of microbial communities are associated with the loggerhead sea turtles. So we are investigating the oral and cloacal microbiotas of the sea turtle and the microbial communities on the uh, skin and the backs, the carapax or the shell of the sea turtle. But why are we doing that? Why would we want to explore the microbial communities of the loggerheads? Well, the loggerhead sea turtle, Careta careta, has been listed as a vulnerable species and there are plenty of efforts in the conservation and we are trying to figure out their ecology and biogeography, their biology in general to help them better. What we know about the loggerheads is that they are long living they can age up to 60 or 80 years old, and they reach sexual maturity around 15 to 20 years old. They are the second largest after the leatherback sea turtle. The leatherback sea turtle is quite special because it is the only sea turtle present right now that uh, has a soft shell. So it's thick skin. It doesn't have a bony structure underneath and it can get quite large. So it can grow up to two meters long and it can weigh up to 700 kilos. Our loggerheads are a bit smaller. They can grow up to one meter long and up to 100 kilos in weight. Uh, there are some records of loggerheads weighing up to 500 kilos, but I think those are quite big exceptions. They are omnivorous. Um, they prefer to eat marine invertebrates. They have really strong jaws, beaks, with which they can break different structures to gain nutrients. And they're just an occasional plant eater. Um, for us, in the Mediterranean, it is important to know that there are approximately 5,000 nests per year in Greece and Turkey, mostly in Greece. And those turtles that hatch there use the Adriatic Sea as a foraging and wintering site. What is important to say here is that uh, our loggerhead sea turtles from the eastern Mediterranean don't travel as much. They don't seem to go into the western Mediterranean. They just keep going forth and back between the Adriatic and the Ionian Sea. So it is quite interesting because they're so isolated, we can compare them to different populations all around the world. To put things into perspective, in Florida and Oman, there are around 10,000 of females nesting each year. So our population is quite good in regarding the numbers and is interesting because it doesn't leave the Adriatic, it doesn't leave the Eastern Mediterranean, but sometimes it might happen or you might get some different turtle in the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. That's why it's interesting to us. But they're threatened. Uh, one of the largest threats that the sea turtles face today are fishing boats, fishing in general. So loggerheads often get tangled up in nets or other kind of fishing gear that incapacitates them or injures them. Other than that, they are losing their nesting habitats. They like to nest on coarse sandy beaches, which we humans are notorious for polluting. So either light pollution or chemical pollution, garbage in general. So we are taking their habitat from them. And it is hard enough as a young hatchling 
turtle that just got out of the egg to try to find the sea and survive all the predators there. So we aren't really making it easier for them. Also, there's a factor of climate change, the increasing temperatures, because sea turtles are reptiles and they depend on environmental temperatures for their sex determination, differentiation, and development. So what we see today is that the sex ratios are changing, female to male, which affects their reproduction rates and population stability in general. Other than that, plastic pollution is a great problem because loggerheads eat everything and plastic. They can mistake um, plastic bags for jellyfish and they often get tangled up in different kinds of plastic debris. We have seen turtles that have lost their limbs because they would be wrapped in some kind of plastic for a long time, and that's really hard on an animal that relies on their flippers to, to live. So those are the threats, but luckily there are plenty of conservation efforts out there, mostly in the form of rescue centers and hospitals that take those injured turtles in and try to recover them before releasing them to the wild. They are communicating fiercely with the public and the fishermen and trying to educate them. So for the public, it's important to know what to do if you see a turtle on the shore, who to call, and if you're ever a tourist in the Adriatic Sea and you're speeding on a boat, be careful because quite often you can hit a loggerhead sea turtle there. We see it quite a lot in our research with our colleagues in the rescue centers. Of course, uh, the aspect of fishing and fishermen education is really important because they are the ones that get into contact with injured sea turtles the most. So they can, what they can do is they can assess the state of the turtle if they should release it to the wild right away, or should they just call the rescue center. That is the little thing they can, they can do. And the other aspect is modifying fishing gear. Uh, the fishing gear can be modified in ways that sea turtles don't get, get caught at all, or if they get caught, they can escape easily from it. With that comes protecting the designated areas that they use for nesting, for feeding, for wintering, for their growth. We need to see what those areas are and try to protect them. For all of this, sea turtle biology research is crucial. We still don't have some basic information about the turtles that we might need to preserve them better so they stay on this planet for as long as possible. So the research that I'm involved in, I already mentioned that we sample the outsides and the insides of the turtle, but why? The questions that we want to answer are, can we discern between different loggerhead populations based on the microbial community composition that they carry with them? Because our population is quite isolated. We can see what's on them and compare it to different populations in the world. We are also interested in discerning between different health states of the turtle. Can we differentiate between the turtle that is healthy and the turtle that has been sick for a while? Because sea turtles, well, everyone changes their behavior when they're injured or sick. And in this case, the turtles, when they're sick, they float more at the surface. They don't dive as deep as they would when they were healthy. So that might affect their microbial communities as well. And the most important part is how can we implement our findings in the sea turtle rescue protocols to just better their recovery and release. So what we know today is that different centers use different approaches. You have centers that clean the turtles vigorously, they just remove everything from them and clean the tanks regularly, disinfecting them as well. And you have uh, other rescue centers that don't do that as much. So we are wondering if there are any effects uh, regarding just how the turtles are kept, how they recovered. Maybe we can give some additional instructions there to just better the sea turtle recovery. 
And this is a video of Ella, the marine turtle that we sampled this year in June after the restrictions because of the coronavirus pandemic were lifted. And you can see that there's plenty of life just growing on this turtle. It's filled with barnacles. You can see the different green stuff, probably cyanobacteria, and uh, the dark brownish would be the red algae. But beyond that, below everything are microbes, different bacteria and uh, other unicellular living things that we cannot see with our naked eyes. So what else is there? The organism that we are quite interested in, organisms are diatoms. They are microalgae known for their silicate terrestrials. So you could say that they live in glass houses. They're quite sturdy glass houses. So we can analyze them even if they're dead, which is quite good for us, which enables us to simplify the sampling process in gaining information about the turtles. They're almost omnipresent. You can find them almost anywhere. And they're used as bioindicators in different water management studies and protocols, which is the same idea that we would want to use here. Maybe we can use the different diatom assemblages to characterize our loggerhead population or a different state of a turtle. They're among the first colonizers of submerged surfaces, which includes marine vertebrates. So you will definitely find them on turtles, on whales, manatees, different kind of animals living in the sea. Apart from the big turtle questions, how we can maybe discern between different populations and different health states of the turtle, there are diatom questions in there as well. So what we've noticed so far is that there are some specific species of diatoms on turtles that we haven't found anywhere else. And we are wondering if they're just opportunists or are they specific to their host? We really don't know. Those diatoms that grow on turtles are considered to be benthic diatoms and they stick to the surface. And benthic diatoms are really underexplored. So we have no idea of any evolutionary implications that might be in there regarding our specific turtle diatoms, either the ones that are opportunistic or the ones that are specific to our host. We don't know which factors are influencing the diatom attachment, selection for habitat, their physiology on our sea turtle coast. And, and we hope to answer that through our research, especially my PhD. Um, a part of our trying to answer some of these questions, and what I've been doing for the last two years, is that we would take the samples from the turtle, we would take some living samples in seawater, and then I would get back to the lab and try to pick single cells out of those samples and grow them in monocultures. Once we have those diatoms in cultures, we can gain enough biomass for DNA studies or for morphology studies. And what we've seen so far that there are some interesting species that seem to cluster together and are found only on turtles. We've seen that in the phylogenetic trees that our colleague has made as well. And this is how it looks like on the shell. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of a part, a small part of the sea turtle shell that fell off on its own. So it's not like you pick a part of the shell and damaged it for the turtle. And what you can see is that uh, there are clusters of diatoms together with this matrix, the weird mushy thing that is actually their extracellular polysaccharide that they secrete to be better able to attach and the rods that you see on this image are bacteria so they live in close connection to the bacteria and it's often that bacteria can use their the diatom products as food and the bacterial products can be beneficial to diatoms or toxic. It depends on the relationship, but it, when you look closer into that, it's quite interesting. And that is how this project came to be. What I want to answer within this project is how do these 
turtle diatoms that we consider could be specific just to the turtles, how do they interact with each other? They grow together in the same place, but is it beneficial in a way? How does it affect their growth if they're mixed? So I have the monocultures, but what happens if I mix one diatom with the other? How do they interact? What is going on there? Also, I want to see what are the microbial communities connected to the diatoms itself. So we have a general idea what is what is on the turtle shell, but there is indications that diatoms can harbor their own communities in their own small spheres. So my monocultures might have bacteria that came from the shell to the culture and might be distinct from another monoculture. I don't know that yet, but I'm eager to find out. And what happens to those communities when you mix them together? How, is it, how does it affect everything once that those diatoms get together. Also, one practical aspect of this would be the question of how is, how is diatom EPS production affected by co-culturing. Diatoms need extracellular polysaccharides to attach to surfaces, and in our cultures, we've seen that they produce a lot of EPS. And we want to see how is it affected by co-culturing and the bacteria in there. Those are the main questions that I want to answer. So basically, it looks like this. This is Polina, one of the interesting diatoms that we managed to get in culture. And in this case, it is moving around. It is not stuck to the surface. If you were to go back to one of the previous slides and look for Polina, you can see that it has stalks and different kind of sticky structures that keeps it attached to the surface. In this case, this is a soup of diatoms and bacteria together, and I want to see who's in there, what are they doing, and how are they affecting each other. This program, this project, might enable me to do that, so I'm very, very excited to do this research. So, to finish up, I would like to thank the Assemble Plus program for enabling me to do this research and of course I need to thank all of our collaborators all across the world. We have some in the United States, South Africa, Belgium, Italy, Greece and of course our local, local volunteers get us samples anytime they find a turtle. So they are the basis of our research and sample collecting. Thank you guys. Other than that, if you have any questions regarding what we do, don't hesitate to contact us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just I type in the turtle microbiome will pop up or Google our names. You see mine is put up there and my supervisor is Sunj Sabosak. So don't hesitate, contact us and stay tuned. Uh, we might have some interesting insights from this kind of research in the next year or so. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you learned something and see you soon.